Well, we love doing this. And there's two reasons I love it. There's no real clock like on Sunday. That's right. Secondly, you get to hear from, when I say better half, it's not even like a half, it's like, a, you know, 95%. And anybody that knows us and knows Sandra knows that's the case. And, um, and third, this is just the most important thing we do as parents and probably in life is, is who we're raising and how we're raising them. And so uh, my, our approach, just so you know, is well, I don't, just speaking for me, I don't ever feel like I can fill anybody's cup in any capacity, you know, whether it's Bible or leadership or whatever, but I do have the potential and the capacity to empty mine. So tonight, we're not gonna tell you everything there is to know about parenting, obviously, but we're gonna tell you primarily what we've learned. And then um, you're gonna come next week and hear from Tim, who's here somewhere, I believe. And, and this is, the, you know, these four sessions are about a whole lot of content from four different perspectives. And we're gonna focus specifically on one kind of slice of it. But this is just what we know. It's not thus saith the Lord, it's just what we know. But we love to talk about this because it is such an extraordinary um, season of life. And we're at that season where we we know some things worked and some things didn't because we're kind of out of the woods. You can catch everybody right. up on the family. <clears throat> well, Andy and I have been married 28 years and 29 this summer. Um, we have four kids. Some of you think we have three. We have four kids. We've got um, Andrew is 24. He uh, has graduated from college and is off the payroll, and that's awesome. Garrett is 22. He also just graduated and from college and is off the payroll. So we're, we're getting there. Um, Allie is 21. She's a junior in college. And then Maisie is our 17-year-old foster daughter. And um, she's been living with us full-time for about a year and a half. Um, but we've been involved with her for about seven years, um, having her in and out of our house yeah. <clears throat> over that time. So again, we are not perfect parents. We do not have perfect kids. We're doing this kind of second round of parenting now. It's a whole different ball game. A lot of the same principles, but not yeah. quite as many tools in our toolbox that we can, you know, whip out. Raising somebody so, else's kids. Yeah. But anyway, it's, but it's yeah. been great. Um, one of the things that we get asked, if this is the just dis, dis, uh, qualifier for just a second, is um, with, for, oftentimes we get asked by single parents, does that apply? How do we apply that as a single parent, single mom, single dad, or blended family? And so I just want to say we have no idea. We really don't. And I say that not because I don't think what we're going to talk about tonight applies. I think it does. But we, we would be foolish to think that we know how to contextualize that. So I believe strongly in the principles we're gonna share, but I would no more say, you know, in your situation, you know, you ought to or you ought not to. The, the one thing that has softened this for us, or I think gives us some context, it's so interesting, both of our fathers, um, fathers died when they were very young. My, my dad, uh, and both of our fathers were raised with single moms. My dad's dad died when he was 17 months old. And her father, Sandra's dad died when he was about, about 10. About 10 years mm -hmm. old. And so just hearing those stories, and then of course knowing our grandmothers and hearing those stories, and they both uh, eventually remarried. But um, those were difficult, difficult years raising. Um, both of them had sing only ch children, mm -hmm. just the, the two sons. Um, and so that doesn't really help us so much as it does remind us that God's grace is so extraordinarily right. sufficient that both of our fathers have been extraordinary fathers and neither one of them had a role model. I mean, right. they just didn't. And so, um, again, so, uh, you know, all these things apply, but for those of you who find yourself going, yeah, that's easy for you to say there's two of you, um, you know, there, God is a father to the fatherless. And we, I think in our marriage and in our parenting have benefited from that dynamic um, in both of our father's lives. So. We really anyway, have. so let's um, we have. jump well, in. Well, in talking about parenting, one of the very f best things we learned, we learned from, from somebody else early on in our parenting. And when we heard it, we knew it sounded like it was going to be something important. But, but where we are now looking back over our years of parenting, we realize how extraordinarily important it was. And it's the four stages of parenting. And those four stages are broken down into the discipline years, which are kind of zero to five, <laughs> the training years, five to 12, the coaching years, 12 to 18, and then after that, the friendship years from 18 on. And um, they're all unique in the approach to parenting. With the discipline years, uh, we learned again from somebody else, 
the discipline years are those years where, where our kids are really beginning to understand that there are consequences for their actions. And then we you know, go through this thing where, okay, well, what do we discipline for? And, um, and we came up with the three Ds, disobedience, disrespect, and dishonesty. Those were kind of the big things. You know, there are lots of things that happen when you're parenting. Some of them you pretend you don't see or, or whatever, but when it came to those three things, those were the things that during those discipline years, we came down on hardest, disobedience, disrespect, and dishonesty. And we just, we used those words even, even before they could understand what the words meant. We would, you know, hold the hands and look in the eyes and say, okay, you were disobedient or you were disrespectful to dad or, or whatever it was. And we actually used those words. The next years are the training years from five to 12. And those are really the years where um, they are beginning to discover on their own that there are consequences, the why behind the what that we've been teaching them. They begin to, to figure that out. We're kind of explaining while we're training. And then the coaching years are the years where we sort of have to take a step back. And um, I like to think of it like they're on the field and we're on the sidelines and we're coaching them along and every now and then we need to snatch them off the field for whatever reason. But, um, but we're really more on the sidelines. We're correcting I and mean, we're connecting more than we're correcting during those years. And then we're here in the friendship years and let now. Let me say one thing about this before we go, you go to this next slide because it's important. We were a student, one thing I didn't mention, we did high school ministry together, did student That's ministry right. together for 10 years. And so we saw a lot of parents do a lot of good things and a lot of not so good things. And here's the biggest, the most obvious mistake we think we saw, and it didn't make full sense to us until we saw this. What we saw is everybody starting one stage late. Not everybody. We saw lots of parents start disciplining here, training here, and trying to be friends here and it's a disaster every single time. You have, you, and again, these, these ages obviously are kid to kid, so it's, you know, they're not hard and fast rules. It's not January the 1st. You know, we put down those tools and pick up the coaching tools. But in terms of working through these seasons, if, the, if there hasn't been discipline, you cannot train, and if there hasn't been training, you cannot coach. And we saw so many parents be lazy here because it's easy to be lazy here because I can just pick them up and put them somewhere. Well, or everything looks so cute. Yeah, everything's you know, cute to everybody. Zero to five is so cute. I'll take a picture of that. Yeah, yeah. It's like, no. Yeah, yeah. so the, this, the, this has to happen in this order. And at, some of you are gonna leave here tonight going, no, we're five years behind. Is there any hope? There's not. No, there is. <laughs> there is. But here's the thing. And we're gonna talk about this in just a few minutes. And Sandra, is, when, because of what can happen here, it is worth all the rest of yes, these. So I just is. didn't want to run Yeah, by and that. another little getting it out of order that's pretty common is to try to be friends here. And yeah. that's not a great thing no. either. So no. that the, the, the order of it really is important. And again, standing on this side of parenting and looking back, we realize it even more than when we were, when we were in the midst of it. So friendship years is where we are with our 20-something-year-old kids. And, and um, it's just really, really fun. It's a really, really fun season. Um, when it comes to coaching though, in these middle school and high school years, one of the best things we learned was from Shanti Feldhahn in her book, For Parents Only, and that is don't freak out. The fastest way to shut down a teenager is to freak out over something bad or to freak out over something good. I think we should just they all say like it together. Either. Ready, three words. Don't freak out. This is the That's best, right. it's the best. It was great advice yeah. for us. And, really you, great advice. and the, the earlier you learned, the better because as your kids get older and are talking, and all of you had this experience on one side of the equation or the other with your own parents, you would start talking and one of your parents would start instructing. And once they start instructing, you quit what? Talking, because they were freaking out. So this, this is how you keep your kids talking. No matter what they mm -hmm. say, you go, oh, okay. And then once the fire That's went right. out, then what happened, honey? Yeah. You know, you just, you just you know, okay. Don't freak That's out. Right. Um, That's right. Okay, yep. so uh, when Andrew was born, he's our oldest, we were on our way to Hilton Head, South Carolina with Sandra's family. And we, I remember where we were, we just gotten off 16 on 92, headed, headed up toward, I guess we headed north toward um, South Carolina to Hilton Head. And he's in the back seat in the car seat. And we started a conversation, uh, this is how many, 20s, he's 20, Long 20. Long time ago. Yeah, we started a conversation about family and um, I don't know how little him, and he was our baby basically. As our first, I think it's our first vacation with him. It probably was, and we were gonna set some family goals. Yeah, so we're gonna set family goals. That's what we are gonna do, yeah. set some goals. And so, and, I, and I'm not really a goal setter, but as, you know, you're scared to death and you're trying to get this right. And I had seen something, I had seen a big, big difference in the approach to family that Sandra's family had and my family had. And I wanted our family to be like her family. 
And I wasn't exactly sure how you get there, but I knew going by what I kind of grew up in and with, would, I didn't think it would get us there, but I wasn't sure that they knew how they did what they did and I wanted to figure it out. So we, we had this conversation. We came up with three or four goals that essentially boiled down to one big objective. And here's what I noticed about her family all those years ago, and it's still the case, that she has uh, two, bro- she has two uh, brother and a sister, so there's five of them. Whenever four of them were together, they would call the fifth one and make fun of them for not being there. We would tell them what grandmama made for dinner and you're missing the biscuits. And we would, we would just kind of mercilessly yeah. bother the person who and wasn't And they with us. wanted to be there. It drove them crazy. They couldn't all be together. There's four of us in my family. I don't remember, we, I was always happy not to, to, not always, but you know, you tried not to, there wasn't, that just, that was the strangest dynamic that and here, we are, here we were, you know, we're, they're all in college or out by that time and they loved to be together. And I thought, I wanna have a family that wants to be together. So I started paying attention to that. And so we came up with, this was sort of our North Star guiding principle. You don't have to adopt this, but if you ask me, I would say, you should adopt this because this is 20 something years ago. We are 20 something years later. And I'm telling you, this was the North Star, but as I'm gonna share in just a few minutes, it impacted our, our relationship. It impacted how we disciplined, how we didn't discipline, what we ignored, and what we took seriously. So we decided the guiding principle, the big objective, you know, all those other little goals, you know, paled in significance to this one big idea that we wanted our children. We wanted children. We wanted children who want to be with us and with each other when they don't have to. That was it. We wanted to raise kids who would want to be with us and each other once they were old enough not to have to. Now, where this made a huge difference, and we're gonna be super specific, it made a huge difference in how we disciplined because we began to discipline toward relational, toward relationship, not just behavior modification. So here's the bottom line, and you know this. You do not want perfectly behaved kids who can't wait to leave home. You do not want perfectly behaved kids that you can't wait for them to leave home. And you don't want perfectly behaved kids that once they leave home, they don't wanna come back to home. That is not success as a parent. And yet, especially in the early years and depending on the model you grew up with, it is so easy to click into parenting toward behavior rather than parenting toward relationship. And they are two different paths. And if you do the relationship, you get the behavior. But if you camp out on the behavior, you may not get the relationship. And one of the things too that we saw in student ministry and um, even in baseball, you know, coaching right. my sons and you know, lots of family and family dynamics, wow, we, we just saw parents who were so trying to modify behavior, control behavior and get obedience. You could just see it in the eyes of their kids. I cannot wait to get the heck out of here. So this, I, I just believe with all my heart, and we're gonna talk about it, is, is a North Star. It may not be your North Star, but it has been ours from the very beginning. That I, because of what I saw in her family, what I saw in my family, and I thought when my kids are grown and old enough not to wanna not to have to come home. I wanna have a family dynamic where they want to come home. Mm-hmm. That's right. And so with our kids being in their 20s, we're starting to see that. And um, you know, even, even college, just college and now after, you see it a little more after the college years are over and we're seeing them want to come home and we're so, so grateful. Mm-hmm. And we did not get it all right all the time. There's a lot of grace and a lot of mercy and all of that, but they really do wanna come home. We love that. Um, just last summer or May, almost a year ago, um, Andy and I, we, my family still goes to the beach every year. Going back to that, that time when Andrew was in the car seat, every year, end of May, we go to the beach together, all of us, my sister and her family, my brother and his family, mom and dad. And, um, and so just this past May, we were going to go, Andy and I decided to go about four or five days early before everybody else got there and just enjoy, you know, being at the beach while it was still quiet before all the nieces and nephews and everybody arrived. And so Garrett, just be the two yeah, of just, us. Yeah, and so Garrett got wind of at? the fact that <laughs> Garrett got wind of the fact that we were going early, and so he called and he said, um, "Mom, can Danielle? This is his very serious girlfriend. Can Danielle and I come to the beach early with you and Dad? We would love to just be with y'all at the beach for a few days." And I'm like, oh, that's so awesome. That's like the bullseye on the target. He wants to come be with us at the beach and. I'm like, no, <laughs> you can't come spend four days with, no. And I mean, I, and it so was like- And so they came and it was wait great. Wait a minute, I hadn't and we finished, had such no. a good time. 
they did come, but I, this, no, it, was, it was kind of like a, both of us were kind of like, well, okay. yeah. Uh, but, yeah. and then we, I remember we were sitting in the car and it was like, can you believe this? Our 20 something year old son wants to come spend four days with just the two of us and his girlfriend at the beach. And, I, and I'm rehearsing. Did I ever have that thought when I was 20 something? Would I have wanted to take my girlfriend and go spend time? No, no, no. In fact, it's just the opposite. And I realized, wait a minute. This is what we've parented toward. This is, this, is, this is the win. This is in some way almost the finish line. So We do recognize that the beach in and of itself is somewhat yeah. of a draw. But, but they hung, <laughs> the four of us played board games we and hung out. We had coffee in the mornings. It was, it was just, it was, it was ridiculous. Yeah. It was fun. It was great. It was a little, little bullseye on the target. Yeah, so, so that was fun. Yeah. That was fun. Um, okay, so let's get practical. So what did we do? You know, what did we do? So we've thought long and hard about this because we, you know, we don't just tell stories. We're gonna tell you some more stories. But in asking the question, again, there's parenting is as broad as we need, you want it to be. But in terms of really narrowing, what do, do we do practically that kept us moving along this uh, relationship uh, versus uh, behavior um, you know, track? And so the, sort of the big overarching idea that I wanna hang some practical things under is simply this, that we emphasize honor over obedience. In terms of just practical daily rules, discipline, responding to disobedience and rebellion and all the normal stuff that we had, you know, raising three teenagers, this was kind of the thing. It was, it's not that, it's not either or, it's never either or, but in terms of which one would take precedent, it was all about um, honor over obedience. So consequently, because that was the case, we didn't have obedience, it's all about rules. So consequently, we didn't have a lot of rules because mm -hmm. we leaned in terms of behavior and in terms of uh, discipline um, toward honor. And you can tell them about our rules. Well, so honor over obedience kind of laid the foundation for two rules in our house. And we would kind of laugh and say, we, we only have two rules here. Um, truth is there were a few more, but, but really the foundational two, two rules in our home were number one, um, honor your mother, which I thought was brilliant. It was Andy's idea, he gets credit <laughs> It, but I was all about it too. So I was, I was good with that one. Um, and, and so honor your mother. What that looked like in our family was our boys would stand at the dinner table until I was seated. And, and they would stand there until I got to the table. They would also stand there until Allie got there. And that, you know, that one little thing, I look back at that and, and there's so much packed into that um, as far as just our boys learning the, the importance of how they will treat future women in their lives, um, how they would treat their sister, all of that. For Allie, another huge win we felt like for them learning, watching Andy honor me and then and being forced to kind of honor us as well, was it set the bar really high for Allie as it relates to the kind of guys that she would let into her life or, or be interested in. We just felt like it set the bar really yeah, high. Yeah, I wanted her to have such low tolerance for disrespect that a little bit of disrespect would go a long way for her. That, that, that would just be so shocking to her system. And so um, the, the, really the number one rule, and I would let the boys, and, and we would disagree with it about this at times, I would let the boys mouth off to me, but they better never, ever, ever mouth off to their mom. And I'm telling you, men, e elevating respect for a woman in the home covers, it covers just about everything, just about everything. And what your children see, especially if you have boys, what your children see is they see here, men, this is so important. Instead of them seeing you protecting your honor, don't you speak to me that way, don't you talk to me that way, they watch you protect someone else's honor. And their future success relationally their future success relationally hinges on their ability to protect someone else's honor. It just does. So by elevating, you know, you, you know, mom over dad, by, you know, mom's the queen and, you know, you, I'll put up with a bunch of stuff, but never mom. It, it set a tone. It really reduced the number of rules that we ever had, had to have because it covered so many things. And the reason I had them stand up is when they were little, you know how this, everybody gets to the table. It's like, don't start eating until mom gets there. You're, it's, you know, chatter, chatter, chatter. And I said, you know what? Let's just decide you don't even sit down until she gets there. And the coolest thing is, once we started that rule, everywhere we went, restaurants, people's homes, wherever we went, they stood at their chair until whoever that was the hostess sat down. It just became a habit. And then when their friends would come over, their friends would sit down. That would be so funny. Their friends would sit down. Andrew and Garrett are standing there by the chair and 
all of a sudden their friends are standing up. They don't know why they're standing, but nobody's sitting but me. And after a while they learned. And so it just, it, and again, it's symbolic. That, that's not a hard and fast rule, but it's, it's mm-hmm. symbolic. And it, 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 made a, it made such a huge difference. So that was um, rule right. number and one. There, were, there would be times where the, I could tell the boys were just about to kind of lash out. Andy would be there or not. And I could see them kind of check themselves and go, okay, mom. You know, just kind of dial it back because they just knew this was not, it was not yeah, tolerated. Yeah, so, non-negotiable. Yep. So that brings us to rule number two. Rule number two, thou shalt not lie. And we didn't have this as a rule because it's one of the 10 commandments or because it's, you know, simply in the Bible or whatever. Lying breaks relationships. It just does. And when we you know, when your kids are lying to you, it, your role as a parent kind of turns into detective and that's not fun. That's not fun for anybody. It breaks the relationship and we have a very difficult time parenting our kids when that becomes a chronic thing. So that was early, early on. We just brainwashed that into them that thou yeah, shalt I said the, not lie. I, the, what we would say is the worst thing you can do is tell a lie. The worst thing is you tell a lie. What's the worst thing you can do? Tell a lie. What's the worst thing you can do? Tell a lie. It was, I just, the worst thing you can do is tell a lie. And the reason why is because a lie breaks a relationship. We don't want to break our relationships. I mean, over and over and over and over. So we're driving one day and Andrew's in the back seat with Garrett. His dad, he said, I think I know something worse than telling a lie. He's back there thinking, because there's gotta be something worse. The worst thing I do is tell a lie. I got some, I said, I said he said, Andy, Dad, there's something that's worse than telling a lie. I said, well, Andrew, what's worse than telling a lie? He said, worshiping the devil. <laughs> so we had three rules. Honor your father and mother, thou shalt not lie, and you shall not worship the devil. So we did. Now, now here's, now we're gonna kind of go back, big picture, because I, w- I wanted to go deep to give you an illustration of what this is like. So all of this, you see, all of this is emphasizing honor over obedience. Obedience is you shouldn't lie, lying is wrong. You shouldn't lie, the Bible says don't lie. You shouldn't lie, lying is wrong. You shouldn't lie, no, that's not how you do it. You shouldn't lie because lying breaks the relationship. And I don't wanna have a broken relationship with you. And I don't want you to have a broken relationship with me. See how that works? Every, this is what we're gonna talk about for the next few minutes. If you, this is where there's a fork in the road. It's not that we are gonna disagree on how kids should or shouldn't behave. It really goes back to why. And when you can hang the why on something relationally, you have begun to develop a culture where you're emphasizing honor over obedience. So for example, um, the rules, the, um, the rules to relationships, um, t- excuse me, not the tie rules to relationships, not behaviors. Tie rules to relationships, not behaviors. What this means is the why is always a relationship. The why is always a relationship. And if you're a Christian, this is at the epicenter of the gospel. This is the New Testament ethic. The New Testament ethic, Jesus said when he, were, he was asked, you know this, what's the greatest commandment? You know, he said, it's, it's, there's two parts. It's love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and strength. That means you believe in God, which means you made, you're made in the image of God. It means you believe in God. It means you believe everybody you're ever eyeball to eyeball with is made in the image of God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and strength. And the second is like it or equal to it, your neighbor as yourself. And essentially, and then Jesus said this, and this is, this is for all of us as parents. He said, all the law, 630 something laws, and the prophets, the part of the Old Testament that just, it's like we wade through, all the law and the prophets, the law is what you do, the prophets is here's what's gonna happen if you don't. All the law and the prophets hang on those two things. In other words, if you get, there's a God and I'm like him and so is the, are the people, and I'm in his image and the people around me are in his image, and I need to treat them with respect because they're made in the image of God. Jesus said, you don't really need any more laws. You don't need any more rules, which means, which means this is important, that every single New Testament imperative, every single New Testament imperative goes back to a relationship. The reason I am to be respectful is not because I should be respectful, it's because I should respect you. The reason I shouldn't lie isn't because lying is wrong, it's because lying breaks a relationship. So this is the heart of the New Testament. It's the heart of God's love for everybody we're ever eyeball to eyeball with. And then as parents, it takes us back and forces us to be a little bit more creative and perhaps a little bit more disciplined in our discipline to make sure kids understand these aren't just arbitrary rules. The, every single rule we give you goes back to either making a relationship better or keeping you um, from hurting a relationship. So along these same lines, another practical side of this is to resist, and some of you aren't gonna like this, is to resist pre-assigning a consequence to a behavior. Now, in some extreme case, you may have to do this, but this is the go-to for parents. They go, you know, if you do that, you know, if you're, not, if you're late, you can't go out next time. If you don't, if you don't make up your bed, if you don't, if you don't, if you do that again, if you do that again, if you do that again, 
That approach to parenting is not the honor approach, it's the behavior approach. I'm trying to get you to do a behavior and if you don't do what I ask you to do, here's the consequence. Well, now it's a game. Now we're adversaries. Now I'm only doing what you asked me to do because I'm trying to avoid a punishment. Now it's, a pu it's punishment avoidance. It's, you know, I wanna become a Christian so I don't go to hell. You know, it's, it's, it's that kind of thing. Whereas if you will make it a habit of just resist ever assigning a consequence to a behavior, and the reason this, is, this goes in the other direction is because this is what honor does. Honor is, well, I ask you to do it, I just, of course you will, I ask you to. You're gonna do it because I ask you to. You're gonna honor me. You're not gonna do this to avoid punishment. You know, what if I don't? Well, well I don't know, I just, we, that's not how we operate. This, you know, we're, the, we're in the honor system. Well, and, and what we would do, and, and Andy was so much better at this than I was, he, we, we got where we would be surprised when they disobeyed yeah. because of that very thing. So rather than just launching out, okay, well, you've been disobedient or disrespectful or whatever, we would then be like, oh slide. my goodness, I didn't see this coming. Andrew, I, yeah. gosh, I'm sorry. Wow, we need to figure out what to do about that. But especially when our kids, again, in middle school and high school, this is such a bigger deal even than when they're younger. But to have that surprise, oh my goodness. Okay, well, we may need a little time to think through this and figure out what we're gonna do because gosh, we didn't see this coming. Yeah, sorry. We don't have yeah. pre-signed consequence. It kind of makes them feel a little bit like we're, for them. And in those middle school and high school years, that becomes so important yeah. to, to, to present yourself almost like I am on, we are on your team and wow, you kind of went out of bounds here. So we're going to have to reel it back in and figure it out. But it, it sort of caught us off guard. So he was so good at this. My tendency, if I'm just being real honest, is to fillet everybody and leave them bloody on the floor. And here's your consequence. And he was so that much is her better. Tendency. It really, it really is. So Her dad's I, a Marine. I saw everything a little more <laughs> black and white and my little analytical brain had a hard time adjusting. And but. we and we would have, I mean, this is, you know, this is like I talked about Sunday. We, you know, we were for our kids. We're for what's best for our kids, but we don't always agree on what's best for our kids. And I, again, it was the student ministry days. And she would totally agree because everybody's wired differently. We would talk, I'd say, here's the thing. After I bandaged up their wounds. Yeah, <laughs> I, would say, I would say, here's the thing. We don't want them to go dark on us. I, right. We can, we can so walk in there and say that and I can take away this and that. We can put them on, we can do all that. We'll talk about some of those things in just a minute. I said, but each of our kids is different. Like each of your kids is different. And I just don't want the lights to go out. Now, you know, we can go in there and, do some of these things and we will feel a lot better. We'll feel, you know, justified and, you know, we told them and I feel better. I said, but remember, our goal isn't behavior modification. Our goal isn't perfect children. Our goal is kids who feel connected to us. That's right. And so there's a time to bring the hammer down. And believe me, we, I'll talk about it in just a minute. There's, you know, we were not soft, but we, did, we, try, we stopped to ask the question, how do we discipline toward relationship? And we'll, um, and really how do we- It's just a different approach. It's not yep. necessarily different things, but just a little bit of a different so approach. So as in, from middle school on, it was, well, because when the kids are young, you know, hopefully you know this, if you're gonna discipline, you discipline quick. So they're associating whatever they did with this discipline. The, the older they get, the longer you should wait. And here's why. Because in the adult world, you can be arrested today for something and not be tried for a year. So that's how you train your kids for the real world. Well, dad, what are you gonna do? I say, I don't know. Well, what's the punishment? And it's like, I wanna know now. And I would, it's she would tell It's driving our foster daughter crazy. Yeah, I'd say, because I'd say, I don't know what I'm gonna do because I didn't expect you to do this. I wasn't prepared. I, had, I don't have a pre-assigned thing. I don't know. And uh, there were occasions, especially um, one in particular, it was like two months later. He thought I completely forgot, but we had to get through the summer before I wanted to ruin my life and his. <laughs> And two months after he really thought I forgot, he said, he was looking at me like, we're talking about this? I said, yeah. And I said, you need to understand this is how the real world works. You, there's not, there's, you know, it's not immediate. And so here's what's gonna happen. And you know what, by, over those two months, he saw the situation completely different. He was so repentant, so sorry, completely you know, embraced what it was gonna be. So timing is everything, but again, it's not punishing behavior, it's trying to figure out how do I leverage this division so there's restoration. Um, the, uh, the next one, kind of along these same lines, a little bit repeat, is then discipline toward relational restitution. We're gonna give you a bunch of illustrations on this because this is the big thing. Because it's easy to take stuff away, it's easy to put kids in time out, it's easy to take away, it's, I mean, it's just so easy to take stuff away. But 
what in the world does that have to do with relationships? Nothing, zero. So they're just there biding is, their time. You're just, yeah, they're just yeah. Yeah, biding their time. So to discipline toward um, relational restitution, that means every act of, since every act of disobedience or every act of, of disobedience or disrespect dishonors somebody, then the question is, in responding to that, how do I rebuild honor or how do I um, restore the relationship? Sandra's yep. got a great story about this. Well, probably during the time of the training years, when we still had babysitters that were coming, taking care of our kids when we were gone, we got back from somewhere one evening and the babysitter looked frazzled. I mean, she had had it. She, she was just ready to go. And we're like, no, 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 tell us, tell us. And you know, kind of like Clay with our kids, they, you know, babysitters, you, you have them too. They don't want to tell you everything. They don't, they don't want to be the bad babysitter that's a tattletale and all that. But we kind of dug out of her some, some issues that she had had with the boys. And um, so the next morning, they, I woke them up early and I was homeschooling, I think at the time. So we had a little bit of flexibility. I woke them up early. And I said, I'm gonna need y'all to get your wallets and I'm gonna take you and we're gonna go do a little shopping with your wallets. And so we went to Kroger to the floral section and I made them both buy flowers for the babysitter. We went home, wrote apology notes, took the apology notes and the flowers and visited her at work. And the boys had to walk in and with they their were flowers. Dying, I mean, here they are like dying. a, you know, Please take Nine something and away. And a half, take 10 something years away. Old. <laughs> really, Dad? Yeah, just yeah, take something. So they had to walk in there with flowers and a note, apologize to the babysitter, ask her forgiveness, and then you know give their gift and note to her, and it made an impact. It was we really had the last time we ever to their had a babysitter. Friends, issue. parents. To, I mean, it, anything that we could do to push them back toward that person was horrible for them. It was, no, 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 no. Again, take every, no, no. You have to go face them and you have to make restitution because we're not punishing you. We are restoring a relationship. What you did broke a relationship. Now we're going to restore the relationship. It takes a little creativity, but um, I, my, it's a lot easier to take things away. Oh, it really quick. is, yeah. but, the, but then you're going to be taking it away again and again. Really things like this, they, they, you get and the more embarrassing faster. and humiliating, the better, that's right? right. <laughs> sure. And here's why that's true. Isn't it true that when you have messed up a relationship, I mean, you have really said something rude to your wife or your husband or your, maybe your son or your daughter, and you know you've screwed up. In order to restore that relationship, if everything was taken away from you, it would not restore that relationship. And when you decide to restore that relationship, you have to what? You have to place yourself beneath them. You have to humble yourself and it's humbling and it's terrifying and you never forget it and you rarely repeat it. Mm -hmm. As parents, if we're not careful, we will rob our children of that dynamic until they're too old to learn from us how to manage that. But that is the key, it's restoration because for the rest of their life, they're gonna damage relationships. The, the question is, will they have the skill set to know how to restore relationships? And every time they're disobedient at home because every rule is tied somehow to a relationship, there's the opportunity um, to teach this. So so um, when uh, one of our sons was 16, he broke the big one in our home and was extremely disrespectful to Sandra. And I, you know, one of the things I, I told our kids early on, I said, when I discipline you, I am going to over discipline you. I am not going to be fair. I'm not going to be just. So we just need to get that. I, I told him that early on. And I reminded him that constantly. I said, here's why. You can commit a five minute crime and spend the rest of your life in prison for five minutes because life isn't even and life isn't balanced. You, you can commit a three minute crime and spend 30 years in prison. That's not fair. That's the way the world works. So I'm not going to be fair. And when I say just, I don't mean harsh or cruel, but you know, I'm not gonna be fair and even. It's gonna be awful. And the longer you have to wait to find out what it is. Anyway, so he had, Oh, I was, you know, it, it, was, it was horrible. And so I wanted to do all the normal stuff, and I'm, but I'm thinking, okay, 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 okay. This is about a relationship, you know, I'm, I'm just mad. So I waited, waited, waited. And then I came up with the greatest idea, and you can use this. I said, you know, because he was waiting. He's like, he, this wasn't gonna just disappear. I said, here's what, here's, I'm, you know, you know what happened. So I want you to ask your mom to go on a date and I want you to take your mom on a date and you pay for the date. It's like, 
again, it's like, could you just take my car? You know, it's like, I, so, so because I realized this, this, is the, this relationship was damaged and all the normal kind of punishment stuff. I mean, it's, it's just stuff, but I wanted that relationship restored. And so here's what happened. So, so I get a phone call. Mom. Yeah, I told him, I said, you have to call your, that's what it was. You have to call <laughs> your mom and ask yeah. her on a date. I forgot that part, yeah. So my phone rings and, you know, his little picture comes up on my phone. I'm like, hello. He said, mom, I'm so sorry I was disrespectful. Would you go on a date with me? And I was like, yes. <laughs> well, so he took me to dinner. He drove me. We had a wonderful dinner together. And it was just, it was just the best talk. I mean, anytime you can get your kids away from home, you know, and just have one-on-one -on -one time with them. It's always, it's always such a great thing, especially teenage boys and their moms. It's, it's a powerful thing and just loved it. And we both had a good time. He enjoyed it too. I think he, he after it was all said and done, he was glad he didn't get his truck taken, but, um, but it was great. And it, it really was, it was a restoration of our relationship. And, you know, when you're a parent of a teenager, you kind of learn to not take things necessarily so personally, because you just know their hormones are raging and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But, but even so, there's still a little bit of a break, a little bit of hurt feelings over, you know, all of that. And so it was, it was a sweet time. It was a very, very sweet time. And but, it was good for all of us. But do you see, and you see, y'all are all smart. You see that him having to do that forced him to fully face his mom. And you can't fully face your mom in an environment like that and not get things out and cleared up and be honest with yourself about stuff. So again, it takes some creativity. There's maybe exceptions, but anyway, you, you get the idea. Um, uh, just real quick, so uh, we, we never did time out. We never, we never did most things parents do anyway. Um, now, one more thing on this, then we're gonna wrap up real quick, is back, you remember with the chart with the four seasons, you remember the training years? You know, it goes from discipline, to training and coaching. The, tr the training years are so important. And again, we, we, we've watched, parents is discipline, 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 then check out and just sort of, you know, we're done, we've finished discipline. One of the most important things you can do in those training years is to teach your kids how to reestablish a broken relationship. Now, this is something you never think about. You know, I'm gonna teach my kids to read, I want them to read and write and play baseball and cheer and all those things. But what is a more important relational skill than this right here? And not everybody knows how to reestablish a broken relationship. You know some adults that don't know how to. Some of you grew up with fathers. They never knew how to reestablish. You knew the relationship with your dad was broken. He knew there was something wrong. And, he re and you, were, you were mad for years and years and years. I don't know why my dad won't call me. I don't know why my dad, I don't know why my dad. I'll tell you why he didn't. He didn't know how. Nobody ever taught your dad or maybe your mom or your grandfather. But we, this is something that has to be taught. People have to be taught how to restore a broken relationship. And so one of the most important things you can do in those training years is to teach. And there's just two words to remember. It's always confession and it's always restitution. That's it. You confessed and, and then you make restitution. I have to pay you back or give you back what I took from you plus a little more. And so if you will, as you're thinking through the, you know, the kaleidoscope of the different ages and seasons and boys versus girls and all that stuff, and think in terms of how, where, how am I and where am I and how can I make sure in the midst of all that's going on that I'm teaching my children how, how to reestablish a broken um, relationship. And along those same lines too, especially when they're even younger than the training years, you know, so often our kids know they've done something wrong and then they don't know how to deal with their guilty conscience and a guilty conscience kind of erects a wall in the relationship and the discipline, the delivery of discipline that you do during those early years actually relieves their conscience and kind of tears down that wall. So it, the same thing applies during those early years as it as yeah. applies in the training and the, and the coaching years as and, well. And this is so important. And taking things away does not relieve their conscience. Taking most punishments, they're punished, but it doesn't relieve their conscience. And what Sandra said is so critical. As long as you have a guilty conscience, there is a wall between you and whoever your guilty conscience is with. So again, pulling all these things together and making it sort of the framework for thinking through discipline in every season, all the way, all the way along the way, whether it's early on saying this is the reason we don't lie is because a lie breaks relationship, all the way up to, hey, take your mom on a date. It's all the same. It's all, you know, 
placing honor in relationships over just uh, behavior modification. We are out of time. Any final, any closing words? You know, the last thing I would say, I know some of y'all have really, really young children and where Andy and I are sitting now looking back, it's easy for us to embrace the idea that the, that the years went by really, really fast, but some of you are in those seasons where the days are super, super short. And we've said this before, but the days of parenting really do sometimes seem long, but the years are so, so short. They, they really are. Your kids will be 25 one day. And <laughs> the way that you parented, the things that you taught them, the investments that you made in them will be part of their story that they tell for the rest of their lives. And, and, um, and that day will be here really before you know it, trust us. Because we, I, there were a lot of days when people would say that to me, I thought, well, I do not believe you because these days are slow slow days. But the, while, the, you know, while the days may be slow, the years really, really do fly by. And my last thing would be this, that your greatest contribution to the world may not be anything you do. It may be somebody that you raise. So do it right, get it right, and aim toward kids who wanna come home and be with you when they no longer have to. 